Congress. I would like to welcome everyone who is joining us, uh, both on Facebook and YouTube platforms. This is the third of our Universal Basic Income uh, Conversation Series uh, that is being run by the African National Congress for the purpose of contributing to ongoing debates about various pathways to a socially just South Africa beyond the pandemic. We are all yet to come to terms uh, with the exact social, economic, and even political uh, devastation or impact that the pandemic will leave behind. However, data re released uh, just this afternoon by the Statistician General uh, gives a clearer indication of where we are all headed, which is an uncertain and therefore insecure social and economic future. Whilst it is important for all of us to imagine South Africa beyond the pandemic, it is just as important to appreciate that the pandemic found us riding a wave of another pandemic. That is a pandemic of extreme poverty, extreme insecurity, inequality, and a pandemic that is particularly pillared by unjust ways in which income and wealth, as well as, uh, if I may add, well-being has been distributed uh, among South Africans. Uh, for the past 26, uh, 26 years of what I term the conceptual post-apartheid South Africa, income has not only worsened, but a few reports that, that have been released by State SA show that uh, income inequality and wealth inequality in South Africa continue to have a spatial, a gender, a racial, and even age uh, phase to it. Now, as we imagine a post-COVID-19 South Africa, the temptation for many of us might be to retreat uh, into ideas that we know or structures in which we feel comfortable. For those who are afraid of change, it may seem even safer not to try any radical reordering of our economies. But the question has been posed and, and deserves to be posed again, that what if our very idea of how a society ought to function is at the very heart of the disparities that preceded this pandemic? This question is particularly important for us to answer because South Africa is not only at crossroads as we speak, or the post-apartheid order rather, but in many ways, so is the political standing and image of the African National Congress in society. Uh, a widening trust deficit between the movement and broader society, uh, as witnessed in our declining electoral fortunes, suggests that there is an urgent need for us to find comfort in rethinking our pathway to genuinely con uh, creating a better life for all. Now, this afternoon, like we did in the previous sessions, we switch from the academic perspectives to two sessions with, uh, from two sessions with Professor Standing and Professor Taylor and seek perspectives from the statistician general, two representatives from the private sector and one representative from civil society. First will be Mr. Risenga Maluleke, who is our esteemed statistician general. This will, he, he will be followed by Mr. Colin Coleman, who is the former CEO of Goldman Sachs, no stranger to South African political discourse, as well as the current senior fellow and lecturer at uh, Yale University. And then Mr. Coleman will be followed by Ms. Isabel Fryer, and I hope I pronounce that well, Isabel, who is director of the studies in Poverty and Inequality Institute. Now, without wasting much time, I will move straight to our statistician general. Um, I know it's been a very busy day for you releasing uh, unemployment figures, Mr. Maluleg. Could you give us a snapshot of the state of poverty and inequality in South Africa today? Who are the poorest of the poor in this country? Where are they based mostly? And what does their plight look like? Thank you indeed, uh, Mukove, and uh, I need to appreciate this platform you have given us as Stats SA. Uh, and indeed, the role of Statistics South Africa is not to dabble into policies, just to make numbers available. Mm -hmm. It's even a lot more uh, interesting when we are talking on the ANC platform because uh, we must always, uh, uh, and not even the ANC could have been the DA or any other political party, we must always demonstrate that uh, we are free from uh, political influence. So I will just share the numbers and mm -hmm. uh, uh, it will be quite interesting. We have just released today 
the quarterly unemployment, I mean, the quarterly labor force survey that indicates that unemployment is sitting at 23.3%. I've seen a lot of commentators saying that Stats SA is actually bringing the unemployment right for political expediency. But uh, if you ask me, uh, we always measure according to uh, international best practice and the guidelines that come from the International Labor Organization also prevail to us. And in this regard, I want to say that unemployment is a function of being actively looking for employment, actively looking for employment. Uh, and, and being able to take up such employment whenever it becomes available. And in this regard, uh, the people of South Africa, as we have seen in other regions of the world, didn't actively look for employment because they were seated at home during lockdowns that were implemented by different countries. And indeed, ours is South Africa. On the GDP side, we have seen the economy uh, uh, contracting by 51%. Uh, as seasonally adjusted and uh, uh, annualized. But when we look at the unadjusted rate, quarter on quarter, it's, uh, it contracted by 16.4%. And I need to say all these things because they play a critical role when you look at matters of poverty later. Now, I want to start, and Faisal is loading a slide mm -hmm. that uh, talks to uh, prices, uh, uh, not prices, uh, upper bound and lower bound poverty so that we can get straight to that. Mm -hmm. And beyond that, we will take a few more slides. Now, what we are saying is that in the national development plan, South Africa is tracking the lower bound poverty line. So what we are saying is that anybody who cannot, and as of April 2020, we cannot earn 840 rands per person per month will uh, remain uh, what's that poor? That's what we, we are saying. And, uh, and we are talking about this because uh, uh, it's very, very critical to understand that these are people who have to choose between food and important non-food items. Those who earn below 585 rand per month will remain what we call uh, food uh, poor. So that's the food poverty line. But the NDP asks us to uh, focus on this one. But we want to understand that over time, we have been uh, releasing as let's say, numbers that show from where we were in the year 2006, the rising uh, uh, poverty lines from the upper bound, lower bound, and food poverty line. And it's critical to understand that this because inflation keeps on steadily rising. What you could buy uh, in 2006 for a rent you cannot afford to buy today. And on the basis of that, we are saying that 40% of South Africans remain poor according to the lower bound poverty line, which we are tracking uh, in the NDP. And, oh, and this is up to 2015 uh, or in 2015. And I'm saying this because beyond 2015, Stats SA hasn't conducted any income and expenditure survey to help us compute the poverty lines, uh, uh, and, uh, and not, not the poverty lines, to understand uh, the number of people as in persons or the head count of the number of people that are poor. While from the prices side, we've been producing this, uh, funds have prevailed on us not to be able to conduct the income and expenditure uh, income. But what, I mean, a, a, a survey. And in this regard, we also have another one called the South African Multidimensional Poverty Index. And this plays a critical role because we look at matters of, and internationally, they look at health, education, and living standards. In living standards is whether you have electricity for cooking, you have water, sanitation, dwelling. This is very critical because in the previous one where we spoke about the financials, how much you need to have per day, I mean, per month. In this regard, you, uh, you could not have these ones, but you could have a situation where government, and not only in South Africa, different governments do intervene for purposes of uh, providing a safety net for their, for their citizenry. And in our case as South Africa, we don't call it just the multidimensional poverty, MPI. 
We call it the SAMPI because we have introduced economic activity in the form of unemployment. And what we will see in the next slide is that our uh, SAMPI is declining. It's uh, coming out of 2001 where it was sitting at 17.9%, almost 18%, 2011, 8%, and 7% as of 2016. What it means here is that whatever government is doing to provide a safety cushion for the poorest of the poor does work because then we are sitting at, 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 at an international level. Whereas on the other side, when we use the money metric one, where we, use, we looked at the money, how much you need to earn, it has been steadily rising uh, from 2011, indicating that for those who cannot earn that amount, we, uh, they are facing more challenges. Now, let us look at uh, the poorest of the poor, which districts are the poorest uh, of the poor. These districts are actually largely in the provinces of KwaZulu-Natal and the Eastern Cape. And the top 10 come start with uh, uh, Nsika, uh, yeah, to all the way to uh, Nusa Hill. These are the poorest of the poor in the country. And uh, uh, as we look at them, we are able to say that uh, we need to look at drivers of poverty. What drives poverty in our country? Mm -hmm. What drives poverty in our country um, facilitator? Uh, the main drivers are unemployment and the years of schooling. Both mm -hmm. of them as of 2016 accounted for 63% combined. That is 52% from unemployment and from the side of years of schooling, that is education, uh, it, uh, it accounted for 11% and both of them accounted for 63%. What it means, and that's why I started with the issues of the economy and unemployment, is that when people uh, uh, can't get employed, they can't have income. And then the basis of that, uh, they will not be able to uh, uh, live well. And the reality is that the lesser educated the people are, the lesser they are unable to uh, find employment. Uh, Mukowe, you will tell me when I need to stop. I have lost count of my time, but I need uh, uh, to, to know when to stop and when. Now, we need to look at uh, the racial uh, breakdown by population group in terms of who ends what. And uh, uh, let us say that our Gini coefficient as a country is dropping. But as it is dropping, and Gini coefficients shows the difference between those who have and those who do not have in the society. But what we are seeing is that the whites in South Africa earn a lot more about on average, uh, uh, and we are talking about uh, households here, on average about 444,000. And as they earn so, uh, they spend about 350,000. So they have about 100,000 of disposable income that they can use for whatever uh, they need to use. The Indian Asians are earning about 271,000 and they spend about 195,000. So they have about uh, 70, 80,000 uh, of disposable income. The Kalads earn about 172 and they spend about 124. They have about 50,000 uh, rands of disposable income and that this is uh, uh, per annum. And uh, the black Africans earn about 92,000 rands on average, 93,000 rands on average and spend about 68,000 rands on average, which means that they have less than 30,000 rands of disposable income. Now let us look at the white population group that has about 100,000 all the way to the black African. In the end, when we look at the share of income uh, by share of population group. Let us take the whites, for example. Their mm -hmm. income is about 36.4%. That is their share of income. Whereas in population group, the size of the population here is 8.3%. Now let us look at the black Africans, for example. Their share of income is about 49.3%, slightly below 50%, yet they account for more than 80% of the, po uh, the population. Now um, I will rush to other slides in terms of men and women, male and female. And I want us to look at, as of 2016, individuals living in male-headed households accounted for almost three quarters of total household expenditure in the country. And we can see the blue color there that is showing us that 
the uh, male-headed households on the expenditure side were having a 74% versus 26% of female-headed households. Now, let us look. I spoke about the intervention by government in terms of uh, 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 providing a social cushion. Firstly, in South Africa, about 60% uh, of our income uh, is generated from salaries. That's about uh, 59% to be exact. But uh, mm -hmm. let us look at the yellow color particularly. That is grants. And these grants, uh, if we look, especially in the provinces of uh, Eastern Cape, which is the second uh, line from the top, in uh, grants account for 35% of uh, the income of the households in the Eastern Cape. That is followed by Limpopo at 30% and followed by the Northern Cape. Generally, rural provinces are actually having more uh, grants than the national average, because we can see below uh, the RSA, the, the two lower ones are Gauteng and the Western Cape, which anyway have the highest proportion of their salaries, uh, their income coming from salaries. And in this regard, what it tells us is that uh, 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 in the rural provinces, your, while your, in, your, your grants are not the highest source of income, they provide the cushion, especially in the Eastern Cape and KwaZulu-Natal, where we have seen that the poorest of the poor are there. Now, uh, I want to talk, uh, I want to spend my last uh, uh, input talking about the girl child on education. We have already seen that male-headed households stand a better advantage. There is a slide we didn't bring here which shows that women, even the most educated women, earn about 92% of what men earn. Actually, on average, women in South Africa earn 78% of what men earn. But the girl child, when, uh, the reasons why children are not at school, seven to 18 years, it's largely for different reasons, no money, all these issues. But mm -hmm. in relation to family commitment, the girl child with a lighter color of purple there is stopped from going to school whenever an uncle is sick or whenever uh, there's a sick member uh, because of family responsibility. Sometimes the girl child is looking after the children of their own. They, they are looking after children of their own. Whereas boy children are free from family commitment. And when it comes to them not going to school, the boy children are saying education is not important. Uh, as we'll see, you can see they are swapping. When we talk about the importance of education, the boy child says, education is not important, but the girl child says, education is important. I want to go to school, but the girl child is not allowed. The next slide says Njihela Kuala, and I need to explain it briefly in, the, uh, in a few seconds. When I was young growing up in, 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 the, in the village in Limpopo, our parents, our fathers used to work in, as migrant workers in uh, major cities like Johannesburg, Cape Town, everywhere. Our mothers who used to write letters uh, using us as scribes because our mothers were illiterate, couldn't end a letter by saying, I love you, my husband, or I miss you. Because children were not supposed to hear those words. When they write them down, they would go blind. If they hear them, they would go deaf. So uh -huh. the standard way of finishing a letter was in the hella kuala, meaning that in the federal hanaipa, I finish here, but it's got a, a message in it that never and never in the history of our country or that of the world should we allow any section of the society, the poor or otherwise, women and children, the girl child or otherwise, not to be able to express themselves because we have excluded them and left and leave them in poverty. We should leave no one behind. And the next slide seems to be blank. And as such, I will not be able to continue. I thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. I think we, we I, I, I precisely sought that particular context or background uh, in order to give um, our discussion context and uh, the data that we have been presented with is particularly to lay a foundation for the discussion that is to follow. I will now move to Mr. Coleman uh, 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 precisely because of a presentation he made at the University of Cape Town uh, on the 15th of July this year, uh, you delivered the University of Cape Town Vice Chancellor's open lecture during which you make a case for a basic income grant amongst other recommendations 
uh, to be implemented as early as next month. Uh, uh, specifically in your opening statement, you argue that there is no country that can survive the kind of unemployment that South Africa is currently enduring at the moment. Uh, why does South Africa need a basic income uh, today? And what about the prevailing conditions in SA? Uh, would a basic income grant then remedy? Mr. Coleman. Thanks very much, Mukherjee, and uh, congratulations to you on the very professional manner in which you've conducted this, and it's been a pleasure to be part of it. Thanks. Um, the the picture behind me, the work of art, is 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 not is not coincidental, because what that image tells you is that we all need to think, and we all need to reimagine our worlds. We cannot be bound by ide ideological traps, be prisoners of ideology nor economic orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. And the post-COVID world as around the world, whether in where I am in New York at the moment, uh, in London, in the European capitals, in Asia, uh, there is a dramatic rethinking, reimagining of capitalism in uh, the developed world. And you have uh, mainstream financial journals like the Economist and the Financial Times, calling for a reimagining of capitalism, including uh, the concept of a basic income grant, uh, including uh, unemployment benefits. And these spectrum of interventions for, from a fiscal stimulus side, and these countries obviously have tremendous power and economic resilience uh, and the ability to undertake trillions of dollars of stimulus, which South Africa doesn't. Uh, range from effectively intervening and paying very significant fractions of the uh, employment wages right to paying for people to go to restaurants in London uh, to be subsidized in order to stimulate uh, aspects of the economy. And so, you know, we really have to get out of, uh, somebody said to me, navel gazing in South Africa. And look at the world with fresh eyes because when you hear the statistician general and it's a great pleasure to be on a panel with him talking about these levels of unemployment and i'm going to give it my own color quickly uh it uh it means that when i when i delivered this uct's lecture i started with the words south africa is in trouble and it's in trouble because uh, the levels of unemployment inequality and the legacy from which that comes means that unless the political organizations respond uh, to the popular, the popular reality on the ground, uh, the, you know, the masses will define their own solutions. And they, those may be, as we've seen in various countries, reactionary populist Solutions, there may be progressive solutions, but the African National Congress obviously has been battling to try and articulate um, a vision, practice, and uh, implementation strategy that makes the difference. And I do agree that the social welfare and broad um, interventions of the last 26 years uh, have created um, the rise of a lower middle class uh, in South Africa and protected the poor, but COVID has stripped away significant aspects of that. So today the reality is when you look at this um, quarterly labor for, for survey that whilst we had 16 and a half million people in employment prior to COVID, we now have 14.1 million uh, in employment. We had prior to COVID 10.8 million unemployed. So if you add this 2.2 million, we're really at 12 million unemployed and we are at 14.1 million employed. Now, so the expanded unemployment rate of 42% may be an aberration uh, because of technical factors of taking this 5 million people out of the labor force. But over time, we will see that the unemployment rate is dangerously close to 50%. And, and no country can survive 
that level of unemployment. I did say that uh, when I spoke. And I think the Statistician General has, has kind of highlighted many aspects of how it differentiates and, and speaks to women, youth, uh, and black people in South Africa in a disproportionate way. And so um, as a result, my view is South Africa needs um, to have within the constraints of our GDP growth that in numbers uh, is officially forecast to drop by 8% in 2020. 8% of 5 trillion is 400 billion. Uh, so we've lost $400 billion over rand of GDP, and we are going to have to uh, work out ways of regaining that and regaining the 300 billion rand of taxes. And actually spending, as I quantified, 140 billion rand, which is what it would take uh, to fund 10.8 million unemployed people with 1,080 rand per month, uh, that's a one, 140 billion. Um, that 140 billion uh, um, um, investment in uh, a basic income grant to direct uh, and focus on the unemployed, uh, and I'll come back to that in a second, um, is a very practical uh, and very directly beneficial stimulus to those with most in need. And uh, let's remember, besides the tax crawlbacks and various things that people talk about, the stimulus effects for those people being able to buy food, clothing and essentials in terms of how that will then stimulate the economy uh, back into the food, clothing, retail sector and be also a driver of economic activity and with it increased fat payments and increased corporate tax, uh, you know, has a lot of benefits. Now, I wouldn't be proposing this if we couldn't fund this in a fiscally neutral way. I know you're going to have a second round where we'll talk about how, right. but I have looked at the tax system in a lot of detail and quantified how we can redistribute 140 billion rand of existing uh, tax net uh, so that we gain. Now, this will involve some sacrifices to the middle class and to the wealthy, but what they will be achieving through that is a greater, much more stable, secure society in which the 10.8 million South Africans are unemployed, who really, frankly, and we must all be honest, have no hope of employment, really, in the short term, in the, in the next year or two. The government's economic program is going to take time, in the best case scenario, uh, to take off. And so we cannot abandon uh, you know, effectively almost 15% to 20% of the population in South Africa. We cannot abandon these people. We have to take care of uh, this and um, as a moral, compassionate uh, movement, uh, we, ha we have to show that South Africans from the top down are prepared to make the sacrifices to help those most in need. So perhaps I should pause there because you were asking me why we need it and what is the economic benefit and the societal benefit. And I'll come back to how we fund it if you like later. Certainly. And in fact, uh, before I let you go, Mr. Coleman, I, I, I just want to touch briefly on something you mentioned, which we don't hear enough of, neither here in South Africa or around the world for that matter. This issue of prospects for employment creation uh, 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 the extent of unemployment prior to the pandemic was already at, a, at historic highs. And, and, and a lot of uh, uh, comments that, are, that we receive uh, planning for this particular conversation it always borders in the lines of a basic income grant would be free money, uh, people need jobs instead. And I understand the, the, the level of attachment and value that people attach to jobs. But the, the, what are the odds of this massive employment that is so desperately needed? And does that necessarily act as a countermeasure to efforts that seeks to realize a basic income? Or can the two coexist moving forward? Big is not a replacement for our need to grow the economy 3 to 5% in the medium and the longer term, nor is it a replacement 
for us needing to create 5 million jobs. And in the Cape Town speech in the 10 point plan, I talked about reimagining our industrialization architecture, our spatial apartheid architecture. I talked about uh, our infrastructure plan, but our practical way of dealing with the infrastructure plan. So all of those things need to take place. But let's be very clear, any conservative uh, bland commentary that says a basic income grant is going to create dependency in South Africa uh, is articulating extremely callous view of the world because 1,080 rand a month into the hands of people who have no income is, pure, is purely helping them subsist. This is not replacing their need to go and find work. So their driver to find work will still be there, uh, but you will be giving them a helping hand. You know, it's Martin Luther King who said a bootstrap man uh, you know, cannot lift the bootstraps. And if you have the hand on the neck and they don't have bootstraps, they're not going to pick themselves up the ground. That's a summary, a pricey of, of his comment. But it's extremely um, uh, current in the world. Uh, I'm, I, I'm walked down the street in New York and I can tell you the homelessness picture in New York has become dramatically increased. And I'm sure in South Africa, this, the same uh, visual picture of unemployment and poverty uh, and that threatening uh, our democracy in the, long, in the short, medium and long term uh, is very current. No, th thanks a lot for that. I'll come back to the issue of instability and insecurity that you raised, which I think are just as critical for, for the collective well-being of any nation. But Isabel, this may be an ideal time, actually, uh, to bring you in because uh, I was quite surprised to see what Mr. Coleman is saying on the editorial of uh, the New York Times as soon as the pandemic happened. The idea of a basic income grant was, uh, uh, in a way, put forward as one of the ways or one of the policy options that need to be uh, on the table. But your research and advocacy work around basic income uh, 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 far predates the, 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 you know, the pandemic or, or the hype that it has picked up around the world, really. Uh, and so from your years of research and advocacy work, what, in your view, would be the main justifications uh, for, for why a post-apartheid, and I say post-apartheid conceptually, uh, because sometimes the word post-apartheid is used to describe a South Africa today that is somehow detached to the apartheid South Africa. But in your view, why, why does South Africa so desperately need a basic income today? And what is the research experience around the world saying? Thanks very much, Rakova, and thanks for inviting me. Um, I have got some slides, some of it has been touched on already by the two comprehensive presentations, but let me just proceed with those. Um, and uh, there you go. Uh, um, so just in trying to, to collate some of the information around the questions, um, I'm just gonna very briefly look at the poverty trends, unemployment, I mean, today's figures, um, something which people haven't talked or touched on, that's the obligations on the state in terms of the constitution, which is um, something which we should never move away from. Looking at the current social security coverage and global findings. I'm gonna be speaking really quickly because we have 10 minutes. So that's basically a minute a slide. But I just wanted to start. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and McCauvey, can you tell me when I'm running short before I hit my last slide? I um, I thank you. I just wanted to start off with a definition because not everybody speaks about the same thing when we talk about a basic income grant. Mm -hmm. So I refer to a regular, rights-based, unconditional cash transfer paid to individuals. So in other words, I'm not talking about a, a system where there's a means test or conditions to meet, such as going to the clinic on a monthly basis. Um, mm -hmm. I'm also not talking about where there's uncertainty of eligibility, having to prove every month that you're still eligible. Um, some people refer to payment in kind. We, uh, the research that I refer to shows that re, uh, payment in kind, such as seed or food, distorts local markets. Um, people also talk uh, glowingly of payments to households. We've also found that within households, there's often capture of income by hierarchies within that, often patriarchal um, or age-related hierarchies. 
Um, if it goes into individuals within our household, um, there is a benefit where poorer, poorer households tend to be larger households. So though it goes to individuals, um, the more households in an individuals within a household swell the amount that goes in. Um, and I'm also referring to universal payment through a central register. Um, what needs to be said is that when you look at the total cost of a universal transfer scheme, a lot of people look at the gross costs, but in the, and, and this is one of the questions you asked, where you claw it back through the income tax or other tax systems, you reduce the cost, so it's a net cost. So, so that's basically the concept that I'm talking about, is this payment that's going to individuals uh, through the state, but also recovered from, uh, from people who are above a certain income threshold. Uh, you talked earlier, and so did the Statistician General and Colin, um, about poverty levels. And the Statistician General spoke about multi-dimensions of poverty. I think it is just important to touch base on the question of income poverty because that is a reality for people and I'll proceed to talk why income is so important in South Africa but um, basically income poverty has been increasing since 2011. I think it's important for us to recognize what the NIDS CRAM data which was a very rapid um, research survey in, in April May 2020 found around the impact um, of coronavirus. Now, this was before the stats, is, I mean, that this um, DSD grants had gone out. So it's important to recognize that. But without the, the emergency grants of Stats SA, oh, why do I keep on saying it? Sorry, DSD, 47% of respondents reported that their households ran out of money to buy food in April 2020, which of course was the first month of lockdown. Uh, prior to uh, compared to 21% of households that prior to lockdown um, had run out of money to buy food. One in five respondents reported that someone in their household had gone hungry in the previous week, and one in seven reported that a child had gone hungry in the last seven days. I think from a humanitarian as well as a developmental um, response, as Colin mentioned, uh, interventions are really important. I think we, we need to recognize nationally that if, you keep, if people below the food poverty line are not able to develop the cognitive and physical development that we need to have a, a stable society and a developed society. We talked about the low, um, the, the low abilities of children in, in schools, poor children in schools to meet reading and arithmetic requirements. A lot of people attribute this to the conditions in the school, but we need to recognize that the that evidence shows that kids are unable to reach that development ability because they don't have the cognitive development because of the malnutrition and starvation. Uh, that's just a, a graphic representation. This comes from the most recent uh, poverty trends report. You can see 20, until 2011, we had a decline in poverty um, and income poverty and, and to, um, from 2011 to 2015 on all three poverty lines, we see an increase there. So the question that you asked me is why universal basic income grant? Mm -hmm. um, and what I touched on previously is that in South Africa, in, uh, basically, we are incredibly wage dependent um, for wages and income in South Africa. And a lot of that is due to previous land dispossession, the prohibition on businesses and the poor skills transfer, which comes up again in the unemployment rates. So unemployment is extremely high. There are various reasons and drivers for that, including deindustrialization. Um, so my argument is we need to stimulate economic activity beyond the formal uh, labor market. But we need to recognize that with no disposable income, in society, there's no demand. So you cannot kickstart or sustain demand in the absence of disposable income. We've seen state development finance institutions uh, giving out seed money for small business development, but there is no sustaining of that demand in the absence um, of, of, of disposable income and hence no employment creation through these businesses. Um, so that dependency needs to be interrupted and broken. Um, and here I quote, very briefly from a NEDLAC Comprehensive Social Security Task Team report. I'm not sure if I am able to do so, uh, but we've been looking at social security expansion for the last eight years within NEDLAC. Um, and one of the things that we're looking at right now, as I'm sure Professor Taylor spoke to you about, was a basic income grant. And specifically what we need to factor in is the multiplier impact that a basic income grant could have. So it would pay for itself and again, um, so there we say that we, we see that the consultants said that based on analysis of the multiplier effects of the BIG, 
grant has the potential to positively contribute around 0.5% to GDP growth over the forecast period that they were looking at through improved household demand and therefore also increase the employment rate. That's important to know is that a basic income grant is capable um, of, of ultimately paying for itself. So just very briefly, I was looking at the unemployment figures um, and we've got this very strange anomaly that while formal narrow official unemployment fell to 23.3%, um, the broader definition of unemployment rose to 42%. And I would argue that this shows that the uh, second last bullet point that the formal labor market is increasingly irrelevant to an increasing number of poor South Africans. Um, so we've seen people stopping looking for work. So it doesn't mean that more people are employed, but people have literally fallen out of the labor market. Um, and I think that this is incredibly dangerous uh, as a situation because it means that people are being untracked in terms of getting back into the labor market. You see the youth unemployment uh, figure there for, for the broad definition of unemployment, 73% for 24 year olds um, and 48 just under half for uh, 34 year olds. So I'm just, um, I know that this is something that most people are aware of. There is a constitutional obligation on the state to give access to social security. Currently the social security system only has grants for children or age pensioners or people with disabilities. Although that amounts to 80 million grants, which were paid in September 2020, there is no policy in our social security to include working age people into social security. Our social security system is based on a, a five-state um, system which looks after the vulnerable, but is not premised on the fact that working age people would need to have income support. So that is the crisis that we're sitting in. We need to realize that, we, that the levels of unemployment in South Africa suggest we need state intervention. Uh, what I wanted to say in that regard as well is the social relief of distress grants, which I'll touch on briefly now, is the first time that the state has, has recognized the need to provide cash support to working age people. And I think that's significant. I think that the state really needs to be applauded. Um, and so looking at what the COVID-19 response by the state is for social security, we need to recognize it's until the end of this month. I just checked with DSD before I came online. There has been no announcement, although there's been a lot of talk about expansion. So, so that's something which we would really appeal to government to make uh, certain because a lot of people are in dire distress um, and are very, very worried. So there's been a top up to the old age pension and disability grant of 250 rand per month. Um, there is a single payment to caregivers per month for people who receive the child support grant on behalf of children um, of, of 500. Um, but the point is that that actually renders caregivers ineligible to receive what has been this really significant grant, the Social Relief of Distress Grant of 350 Rand, uh, because it means that caregivers officially are in receipt of income, even though they are just proxy recipients for the children, uh, the children benefit. They're the beneficiaries. So if you look there at the second last large bullet point, 8.9 million applicants were noted by the 4th of September this month, well, this month clearly, 5.5 uh, million people were approved. Um, and you can see this uh, at the bottom, 1.8 million people of those were women, 3.7 million were males. Um, the point about a means test in terms of the eligibility is that it discourages any incentive to try and earn an income because it automatically renders you ineligible. Um, so I think those are points to, to remember. We talk about a universal basic income grant because the impact of the areas of exclusion on the poor and vulnerable are incredibly dire. Um, and they have secondary impacts, such as I mentioned there, uh, a disincentive to work. So just in um, second last slide, you asked about the global findings. Uh, the, the, the large take home, as has been mentioned by Colin, is that cash transfers stimulate demand. Um, that pro poor state interventions will decrease inequality and stabilize society, which is something which we're quite concerned about in South Africa and increasingly so. Um, if you look at the uh, service delivery intervention, uh, the service delivery protesters really are protesting about conditions, not just about service delivery. So you, um, what we needed to say here as well is that 
globally, the most successful interventions in terms of COVID-19 recovery have been aimed at the individual household and business. What we've seen really in South Africa is that there's been a lot of emphasis on business intervention and recovery and rescue and guarantees. Um, we argue that you need to invert that. So the pyramid needs to be inverted. You need to be um, demand shocking from an individual level to go out to the household and then support businesses. There are very a number of um, examples globally. So the Alaskan Permanent Fund was introduced in 1976 um, because of oil, the receipt of oil, but that's been ongoing. It pays an annual dividend. The Namibian Basic Income Grant Pilots in 2000 and between 2008 to 2012, right on our doorstep. Um, I think it's important to know that Brazil actually introduced a basic income grant in addition to the Bolsa Familia, which is what everybody talks about. The basic income grant was a shot, it was a, a payment per month to households in order to reduce the poverty gap and it effectively lifted everybody out of, out of food poverty because it raised the bar. Um, if you look currently, uh, there's a Spanish targeted grant which has been introduced in March this year, the Ingreso uh, Minimo Vital program, which is actually a a permanent program that was introduced in the midst of COVID, but it is designed to reach beyond um, as a per permanent entitlement. Um, and then it's interesting that Germany, for instance, has just adopted um, last month a universal basic income grant pilot in order to, to look at the impact. So there's an ongoing interest uh, in, in large response to your question. There are permanent examples, um, and there are still questions around the efficacy in terms of situations, specific situations to both developed and developing world. Now, I'm not going to continue much on this slide because I know that others um, have looked at it, but my, my, my point is that there are ways of financing. I believe that in Colin's Cape Town presentation, he argued for a budget neutral intervention um, my argument would be that in the situation of trying to shut our economy um, into recovery, we need to have something which is not budget neutral, um, but provides more monies into society, whether that's through quantitative easing, development mark funds, there are many modes of financing. Um, but I conclude there was something which Guy Standing, who, who you've spoken to you before, said on a, a rewired podcast I do with Uva Kabula, that we cannot afford not to have a universal basic income. And I, I think that that is the approach that we need to start from. Not can we afford it, but we need to recognize we can't afford not to. Thank you very much. Thank, thanks a lot. Uh, and, and I think before um, I, I bring you back, uh, uh, Mr. Coleman, and, 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 and we talk about uh, the financing of, of, of basic income, um, I just wanna quickly go back to the statistician general and ask a, a, a question based on previous work done on where exactly do South Africans who receive social grants spend their money? What do they mostly spend it on? Because there are some of uh, suggestions that I think, uh, as, as you mentioned, Colin, may be even insulting uh, that, well, if you give people this money, they are going to drink it, they're going to smoke it, or uh, they're going to gamble or, you know, a, a particularly dis disturbing picture of the marginalized or those in the periphery it tends to be projected from time and time again. And, and, and I brought the statistician general to give us statistical facts about the state of South Africa so that we have a, a bit of a solid background to work from. Now, SG, just to kindly ask if you have any data on where those who are receiving social grants seem to spend most of their money at. I think that would be very helpful. I'm not, uh, I was struggling to unmute myself. Now I'm back to, uh, what's that, to stage. Oh, I don't have the exact percentages with me here now. But uh, uh, we look at uh, the expenditure in terms of your uh, quintile, not quintiles. We look at quintiles, we can look at deciles. But one of the things that we have picked up is that the poorer tend to spend more money on food as well as on transport than uh, the, uh, the, your, your richer uh, uh, or your well-off members of society. 
Uh, but when you look at the number of calories that one needs to take, and I'm talking about food here, that one needs to take, and uh, 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 one speaker amongst a uh, uh, panelist spoke about the whole issue of uh, what people need to have to, uh, uh, and, and especially to prevent things like stunting, wasting, and the like amongst the, the children to grow. So when you look at the number of calories that people need to take, your poorer members of society tend to buy food, but that's not food that is rich with calories. So it's food as in pub uh, that they buy and all the things that, I mean, uh, milli meal uh, that they will use to cook pub and the like, but it's not rich. So it doesn't, it's more like uh, they, are, they are not, they are living to eat, not, not eating to live well. So that's number one. Number two is that the poorer members of our society are far away from places of work. So if you look at, uh, and this is caused by the prevalence, there's still a prevalence of what we call the apartheid spatial framework in South Africa. Because uh, with a few people who come from marginalized communities who have moved to the leafy suburbs, the majority of the people are still in rural areas in the, in the, in the uh, rural settlements as well as in townships. So for someone to have to go to work from Soshangube, from Artridgeville, from Muloto, uh, they spend four hours on the road traveling to work every day. Whereas the most affluent, they don't need to travel to uh, buy a newspaper. They read it online. They don't need to travel a lot more to go to meetings. They can actually pick up a phone and make a call. So the poorer ones spend more money on food, but it's not your calories rich food as well as on traveling or on transport actually thanks and no before i conclude on that we should understand that the face of poverty as we have indicated even on unemployment or anything affects your black africans the most followed by the colors and the Indians are actually catching up with the whites in terms of the lifestyle, including reaching out to education. So when you talk about the poorer and the majority, you are largely talking about collectively your black majority as in Indian, colored and African, but with the Indians moving out towards to catch up with the whites. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Coleman, to the extent that uh that we agree that a basic income grant is not just affordable, uh, but very necessary. Uh, uh, what in your view, and, 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 and uh, one of the things that really made me write to you was the fact that uh, you crunched numbers in that particular paper. In other words, you made a, a numbers based argument and not so much an ideological uh, a, 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 a argument. And, uh, and, and I think that's very, that, that was particularly helpful because it gave us a much clearer idea of the kind of trade-offs that would likely have to accompany uh, the idea of a basic income in South Africa. And so to the universal basic income, to the extent that we agree that it's a socially just direction to go, what would be a socially just way of funding it in a manner that doesn't necessarily achieve the opposite of what is intended to, to be achieved? Thanks. So, so the 140 billion that I calculated you need, and you can distribute that differently. You can distribute that you know, across the unemployed South Africans at you know, 1,080 1, rand a month. You can distribute it to the 32 million adults with 365 rand a month or the 23 million labor force participants with 500 rand a month, and that I'm going to leave for the experts to determine the optimal impact. Um, but assuming that we've got a pot of 140 billion rand that we need to raise in a context where growth is contracting by 8% and we've lost 300 billion rand of taxes, tax income revenue, and therefore the fiscus is very constrained. There's obviously a very big debate about levels of debt to GDP. You know, the US is forecast by the IMF to be at 150%. The UK is somewhere around 110%. Japan is, you know, way off the charts. Uh, 
and South Africa is at over 80%, you know, on a trajectory for going over uh, 100% of GDP in a few years' time. So we have very fiscally constrained uh, environments. So if you talk to the business organizations, they get very anxious about the introduction of a big, uh, in terms of the affordability. So I went through this process of really trying to understand uh, whether it was true that we couldn't afford it and spoke with top tax experts in the Treasury, in the Davis Commission, uh, and a variety of, of, of experts. Um, and I'm not a tax expert, so I, I, I uh, interrogated that. And, um, you know, through a, a number of um, repurposing of current tax expenditure, uh, I'm convinced you can save 100 billion, 140 billion and put that in the high impact stimulus base income grant, grant uh, bucket and, and have that happen. So to give you examples, I won't go through the whole chart, but it is on the web as a, um, it's a public document from my lecture. If you just look at Colin Coleman, UCT Vice Chancellor lecture, you'll find the full chart. But the types of things are, you can save 12 and a half billion Rand by eliminating the medical aid tax credit for families over 300 Rand per annum income. So why are we giving medical aid tax credits to these families that can certainly sustain themselves? It's, it's certainly an expenditure that the lower and middle classes, uh, you know, will, will feel, uh, will feel but uh, it's certainly affordable for them. Uh, I, I talk about removing retirement fund deductions uh, for families over 600,000 Rand of income. Now, again, families are earning over 600,000 Rand of income. You know, it, it's, it's good for them to be able to save through retirement fund deductions, but it's a pain they, in my humble opinion, can bear. Other big items, if we re-engineer the VAT system credits uh, and tiering, including an upward uh, adjustment for old age and child support grants uh, to compensate, you ensure a net gain for low income households uh, and you save about 19 billion Rand. Um, if you introduce a 5% withholding on um, tax on state procurement contracts, Credit, creditable against tax payments. So these people who uh, are inter, at the interface of this highly corrupt uh, and problematic place, where often I would imagine these, uh, these people are not paying their fair share of tax. And if you make sure that before they get the contracts, that 5% is taken off and they have to register, and then having registered, they will then be able to get that as a tax credit against tax paid uh, and, and due. So I think there's a number of areas uh, that I talk about uh, in relating to interest rate deductions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the point being that you don't need to increase VAT, you don't need to increase corporate tax, you don't need, and I would argue it is inadvisable to introduce a wealth tax, why? Because um, the tax, uh, the tax elasticity in South Africa has probably reached a limit. In other words, people at the higher levels, even though speaking to the African National Congress, it might sound uh, attractive to contemplate taxing the rich uh, more, but you may uh, end up destroying the most important tax base that you have. So it's a highly sensitive thing for a finance minister to contemplate uh, doing. And many people would argue will not be effective because you will get tax avoidance rising against the increased tax rate. So these are very practical uh, ways, and I'm happy to discuss the detail with anybody, uh, for you to raise the 140 billion and therefore in a fiscally neutral manner, not budget neutral, but fiscally neutral manner, um, raise sufficient funding to pay for the big. But again, the big, will have a number of stimulatory effects, which will increase your tax revenue, both at the corporate tax rate and at the VAT level. Isabel, 
your your take on 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 uh, just ways, uh, just and sustainable ways of 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 financing a basic income grant in South Africa today. Um, thanks very much. I think that I mentioned a couple of those in my presentation. So um, exploring the increase of a wealth tax, we know that in South Africa, the um, what people refer to as idle wealth, the untaxed wealth, um, a lot of it emanating from apartheid days is incredibly high. Um, and for many, this all goes against the kind of um, use of, of wealth that has uh, that, that would liberate some of the economic activity. So um, the Davis Tax Com Commission Committee, um, as Colin made mention, investigated the question of a wealth tax. Uh, while some people argue that the uh, committee found that wealth should not be taxed, in actual fact, what they suggested was that the kinds of, um, the mechanisms and modalities that would be required to tax wealth would need to be implemented over time. And so we argue that that's definitely something should be, that, that should be looked at. Um, I mean, corporate tax rates have dropped significantly since the time of apartheid. Uh, corporates argue that if you reduce tax on their profits, that that would be reinvested in society. Organized labor and many others have argued that in fact, you've seen um, an investment strike uh, by capital. We've also seen that capital goes offshore very swiftly. And so the question of a, a sort of patriotic uh, bourgeoisie and patriotic capital is not something that we're seeing. So the, the need to look at some kind of speed bump on, on the monies going out is important. Um, I mentioned the fact that uh, many people argue that the uh, GPF, the PIC and other sort of funds have a huge amount of surplus, which can be uh, utilized and, and, and put through in terms of described assets. Um, and that's certainly something which many argue need to be looked at. What we've seen is that the Reserve Bank, as well as National Treasury, um, in our own analysis, have been resorting to very orthodox approaches to the kind of funding financing that is available. Now, that in our current situation is not something which we can afford to do. Um, so we argue that as well as the fact that looking at quantitative easing, uh, what people refer to as a popular quantitative easing, using it for these kind of, of shock treatments, which can then start repaying themselves as the economy recovers, is critical. Um, looking at the issuing of longer term government bonds. Um, globally, people are looking for safe investment uh, havens, and, and we argue that this would be the kinds of, of revenue that the state could raise. Um, would be important. But uh, Mukove, I just want to argue also that many people um, from Department of, of Finance and others would say that the kinds of social spending that we're looking at um, is a, a cost. And, and we really argue that it needs to be looked at as an investment. Uh, the statistician general talked about the, the kinds of stunting, the effects picking up from my point. Um, but unless we are investing in human capital, the kinds of investment in infrastructure and other hard expenditure um, are really not going to have the, the kinds of, of medium to long term interventions for society socially. We're not going to have that kind of future. Well, for all three of you, really, I cannot thank you enough. And as we move closer to our our closing statements on this subject matter, I must say that I, uh, uh, all these conversations that have contributed to our basic income grant uh, debate series are to be collated and th synthesized into a working document that I would then share back with you for further commentary and suggestions in writing. And then once all of this is done, this is not talk about talk or talk for talk purposes. This document will then go back to the Social Transformation Committee, which is currently uh, uh, having ongoing discussions about the most effective ways of introducing a, a basic income grant. And so I, 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 one did not invite you here for the purpose of talking, but rather for the purpose of enriching this discussion. And I will, you know, it is my responsibility or my job to synthesize these ideas, particularly the, the various options that you've all raised and the various grounds uh, on which the argument for basic income grant rests. All of this will be synthesized into a document that I will also be able to share with you. But uh, I, as, we, as we get closer to conclusion, there is something that both of you 
raised uh, before I go to the statistician general, which stood out for me. And for, for you, Isabel, was the idea that a basic income grant would pay for itself. For many, for many people, that might sound uh, like an impossible idea to even raise. I, I remember making the same argument for subsidized higher education for the poor and the working class. And many people thought this is absolutely mad. Now, Mr. Coleman, you raised the issue of how current trends the, 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 the extent of social and economic insecurity at the bottom has the potential of not only gobbling the democratic nature of our state, but rather fueling the kind of populism that we've witnessed across Europe that end up threatening everything that we've built thus far. And I would imagine that some of that is some of the reasons why many people are so interested in actually finding an, a more uh, uh, not just socially just, but sustainable, sustainable way of re-engineering how we look at society moving forward. And so when you, when you give your concluding remarks, I would want you to, to just touch a bit on that and why you think that is such an important uh, point to emphasize within the context of BIG. And I'll start with you, Mr. Coleman, going back to Isabel and then end with the statistician general. So uh, thanks very much, Makovi. Um, on this, on this last question you've just asked, I mean, the reality is that when we're at, and, and I, I got the numbers wrong earlier, it's the 10.8 plus the 2.2 is 13 million unemployed uh, and 14.1 million employed, that's 48% unemployment. Uh, we'll have to interrogate the Stat South Africa report to see how those numbers and the people falling out have affected it, but that's the real world. When you have that real world out there and you have the sort of food in insecurity you're talking about and you have it so racially and gender and, and age determined, then uh, for those without skills, the African National Congress as a site for patronage uh, is inevitably going to be under attack because the, the means for low-skilled people to use political access to gain economic resources will remain a fundamental uh, force. So democracy, uh, somebody said to me very senior, democracy is dying because what you have is you have the layer of democracy on the surface like a cappuccino, but underneath you have this dramatic contest for resources happening amongst those who absolutely have to get it. And if patronage is the means to get the resources into the hands of the poor, then, you know, the political patronage system is a very powerful conveyor belt, whilst the democratic promise of resources in a modern constitutional legal way is a nice idea, but very impractical for you know, for a significant slice of the ANC's constituency. So this is the dynamic, unless we fundamentally deliver the resources in a proper legal, constitutional, democratic way to the ground, we are going to have this problem in the country, in the ANC, in a very significant way. So we have to resolve, and the basic income grant is one of the very practical ways of getting right down to the ground and for the ruling elite, for the economically powerful, they should see the big as a conveyor belt of peace and democracy into the future. And so it's an economic stimulus, but also it's a stabilizer. Um, and I believe, you know, people need to, as I said right at the beginning, you know, really think deeply about the future and how are we going to maintain the Mandela soul in the ANC and in the country and deliver practical um, economic resources to those who need it most. So maybe I'll, um, I'll leave it there. I, I would just maybe just say one last thing, which is, you know, the, the Davis committee, the tax committee has identified a hundred billion rand of potential revenue through tax evasion, illegal criminal activity, and we have to take that on. So we have to give them all the help they can get. And the Auditor General has identified 94 billion in the last 
account that he audited of local, provincial, and central government misuse of funds in various forms, whether wasteful, irregular, or unauthorized expenditures. That is a combined 200 billion rand of management of funds, which is greater than the basic income grant. So if we just drive organized central um, management in the economy of these basic things, you know, and we spend less time debating, you know, the basic income grant and get on with it because, you know, we're debating this stuff, but in October, the grant system, as far as I understand it, falls away. You're going to have people, you know, really be being in deep trouble. It's like in the US, the, the stimulus here has come to an end and, you know, businesses are about to start to fail. So this is a global phenomenon. You have to get on with things. You stop the debate at some point and get on with implementation. But I'll, I'll leave it there. Thanks so much. Well, thank, thanks a lot. And I know if it was up to you, we're supposed to be implementing basic income grant as in next month. So not even next month. What's today's day? The 29th. So in the next couple of days. Uh, uh, um, Isabel, before I move to the, to the statistician general, uh, the, the point is raised which cannot be avoided and is the point of political legitimacy. Uh, as, as a researcher, I have synthesized electoral patterns between 1994 and 2019, it is no secret that the most vulnerable of society underwrite the political legitimacy of the African National Congress. It's not, it's not something to be debated. And so, and, and, and so that's part of the reason why I said what I said uh, in our introduction. Uh, but I, I realized that the statistician general has a radio interview at uh, 20 minutes past six, so maybe you will conclude. I will give him just the last bite to say a few words in closing, uh, uh, and then we'll come back to you, Isabel. SG? Thank you, Mukabe. Uh, let me say that one of the things that as a nation, and indeed other nations of the world, uh, we might want to get as a culture is to inculcate a culture of evidence-based policy formulation and the planning, monitoring, and evaluation of our programs, including this one on basic income, as well as taking out people uh, out of poverty. We might want to get into that space of poverty, um, of evidence. Empirical evidence becomes very critical. Uh, one of the things, and, and I know whenever you talk to the African National Congress, you must always be careful about which countries you use as examples, but I'm a statistician, I'm independent, I can use any name. The United States could not enter the Second World War, especially coming out of recession, uh, without, uh, not recession, depression, without gauging its ability to uh, mount a war and potentially even win. With, uh, they had to use empirical evidence in everything. And while uh, at the time, a lot of power set in, uh, in Europe, largely in Britain, when I was growing up, England was uh, raised as the most powerful nation, but the whole issue had shifted to the United States. So any nation to be able to win I'm not sure if the SG is muted. Um, as, uh, Mr. Malulega, can you can you hear me? I can hear you now. Oh yes, you you went silent for a while, but you can conclude. Uh, the whole notion of evidence is critical for the survival of our nation. Uh, right. Evidence, evidence. Uh, uh, for the future of uh, dealing with any programs and policies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Isabel, thank you so much. SG. I also know that you have to rush. So thank you so much for making time. Uh, and I know you've been in the airwaves since morning. So we, we genuinely appreciate your, your contribution to this discussion. Thank you indeed. Isabel? 
Thank you. I think just very briefly, your opening question is why should South Africa get a universal basic income grant? The statistician general's unemployment figures that he revealed today, as I said, show that increasingly people are falling out of the labor market. So employment is not uh, the answer in the immediate term. I also wanted to indicate, I thought I had it on my slide, that 53% of the unemployed have not yet have, do not have matric and a further 36% have only matric. So we don't have the skills. It's not a question of reskilling people. It's a question of what we do to pull people in to become uh, economically active. You asked why a basic income grant would pay for itself, the kind of multiplier impact. Um, and my argument at the beginning um, and uh, the empirical evidence that, that exists globally shows that when people are pulled in as consumers, they're able to generate the kinds of demand which then stimulates production. If we look at the kinds of reindustrialization um, impact that we need to have, and there are a number of plans afoot for this, this I would argue is the only way that we could get people in as productive members of society in order to address that kind of instability um, there is no argument that says that people do not want to have formal employment, but in the absence of formal employment, as, as Colin said, we can't just leave people on the side. The question of the, the political legitimacy, um, I mean, a number of years ago, there were a political economist uh, pointed out, uh, well, his argument was that in South Africa, social grants by stability from the poor, um, he argued that black economic empowerment looked at transfer of wealth uh, for the elite. So the question has been raised. Uh, what is to be done. I'm very surprised that in a democracy where votes count equally, the majority of people remain poor and our inequality is so high because that statistically doesn't make sense. I think that as the ANC represents the majority of people and, and represents the dream and ideal of liberation, that the question of the adoption of a basic income grant, um, as I know is being discussed within the ANC, really I think needs to come down in favor of a rapid adoption and implementation. People need to have hope. I was talking to Al Jazeera earlier and the person asked, is there still hope in South Africa given the high levels of unemployment? Leadership, I would argue, national leadership needs to give hope. Um, and a basic income grant seems to be the easiest and, and most committed way to ensuring that that happens. Well, uh, thank you so much to, to both of you. And I know the, the statistician general has already left. Uh, uh, I, I cannot once again thank you enough for, for taking time to contribute to our basic income grant conversation series that has brought uh, a multiple uh, uh, perspectives and, 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 and people from different walks uh, of lives to contribute into what would be a socially just uh, South Africa beyond COVID-19. And I, I have to emphasize that this discussion is necessitated regardless of whether we had COVID-19 or not. Uh, I'm, I'm taking note of the agency with which you are both advocating for an adoption and implementation of such a policy. I will convey such remark, those, those, those insights uh, on your behalf. And I'm sure I can see my, my boss is actually uh, here online as well, and uh, everyone else who is listening, I must say the conversation has generated great interest across the entire membership uh, of the African National Congress and South Africans in general, uh, regardless of their political orientation. And I think you have done great justice uh, to the questions that we've posed. Uh, if there are any other questions that I receive or we receive that are beyond my comprehension, I will be writing to both of you uh, to, uh, to explain yourselves further. But for now, I cannot thank you enough. And uh, Mr. Coleman, good man morning that side in the Big Apple. And uh, uh, Isabel, thank you so much for, for taking your evening to chat to us. Uh, and I cannot thank you enough. Uh, I look forward to further uh, taking part in this conversation with both of you uh, beyond this particular uh, webinar. All the best for me. Thank Definitely. you. Thanks for the invitation. Pleasure. Cheers.